Welcome to Three Thoughts On. My name is Rafael, and as you may know by now, this podcast exists because I have a vision of a world where we're better informed, where facts easily surface above opinions, and where wisdom is abundant. When I started this podcast, I was refreshed to find out that I wasn't the only one with this vision. I spoke with my dear friend John Malahi about it, and he was not only excited, he wanted to be part of it. John and I met in New York City back in the late 80s. At the time, I had left Panama due to the socioeconomic instability that dictator Manuel Noriega had created in my country. All of a sudden, I was a senior in high school in a new city with no friends and a very thick accent. Unlike what you see in movies, people at San Francis Prep were kind and welcoming. One of those people was John. I remember meeting John and thinking to myself, I want to speak English like this guy. Fast forward 35 years, and John is now a partner at a law firm focusing on professional liability defense, insurance and commercial litigation, employment practices liability, risk management, and many others. But most importantly, and for the purpose of this podcast, John is a perpetual student of history and his relevancy in today's modern world. Today you will listen to the first dialogue in a series we're calling Think Classically and Argue Better. The purpose of this series is to share possible ways of communicating better by breaking down the various components of the classical, formal, argumentation model. Both John and I share the belief that our struggles in society are in part due to our inability to communicate effectively. We had a lot of fun during this conversation, and we certainly hope this and our future conversations are useful to you. And now, the first session of Think Classically and Argue Better, The Purpose of Argumentation. Welcome to Three Thoughts On. I am delighted to be here with my good friend, John Malahi, on what will be the first of many recurring sessions on interesting topics, at least interesting to the two of us, and hopefully they'll be interesting to everyone else. Uh, how are you doing, John? Very well. Thanks so much for having me, Rafael. It's so good to see you. Uh, obviously, I wish we could see each other in person. The pandemic's changed a couple of things, but communicating any way possible is uh, very important for the two of us because we've been friends for a while, but also for us as a society. I mean, communication is the key, and I'm glad that we get to share our ideas on a certain type of communication, which is argumentation. When we talk about the title of this series, Think Classically and Argue Better. How do we argue better? How do we think classically? Well, not to scare everyone off, but when we think of arguments, people have different mindsets. Most times we think of friends that argue, sometimes couples that argue. And a lot of times there's a um, misrepresentation of an argument being just screaming back and forth with little information being conveyed and a lot of emotion, a lot of pathos being uh, conveyed here. What we're trying to do and hopefully help everyone out there is to slow things down and to say classically means structurally, it means something in the mindset of Aristotle. And we call this the Aristotelian method because he broke down a method as a way of empirically practically looking at things and saying you could present a position and try to persuade an audience against an opponent in a very structured way, in a very professional way is what we'd say today. And a lot of what we see today is not in that format. We can criticize very readily some of the debates that we see, some of the arguments that we see. And and as a lawyer, I could appreciate a good argument if it's structurally sound but also full of credibility. And that's hopefully what we'll try to help people with today is to see it that way, the classical way, meaning the old fashioned way, but also as we're going to present to you the better way. Well, that's, that's interesting. So would you say that when we talk about that classical way that it was more geared towards conveying a point versus convincing the listener of the point? Well, it was both. And, you know, some of our 
some of what we're going to be talking about throughout the series will focus in on what parts of the argument uh, to stress at this point. But really, if we look at the Aristotelian way, which again, just to give the audience a little bit of a background, uh, Aristotle was a student of Plato, who was a student of Socrates. And in some ways, in going from Socrates to Aristotle, we went from a very theoretical, itinerant person such as Socrates, who said, uh, I am going to go around and show everyone how much I know by not knowing anything, to Plato, who actually took some of that and made this philosophy his own in a more theoretical way. And then we get to Aristotle, who said, I'm going to take what I've learned, the good stuff that I learned from Plato, and make it more practical, make it more uh, commonplace here, make it structured, and have a lot of people benefit from that, uh, ranging from politicians to lawyers to military strategists. And uh, I think a good number of the audience knows this, maybe not everyone, that Aristotle was the, in fact, the tutor of Alexander the Great, one of the greatest um, military strategists in the world. But he was also a thinker. Uh, so was Caesar. Caesar, if we actually go down in history down to the 50s, 60s BC, uh, we look at Caesar, who's also learning this type of thing. He was a statesman. He was a military strategist. That's who people were. They advanced in society by able being able to convince audiences. And that's what we'll hopefully uh, tell your listeners here, too, is how to do that, how to convince an audience by presenting an argument in a very rational, professional way without the common way of seeing things, arguing, just screaming at someone. Well, that's interesting. That that actually leads into the question. So let me kind of rephrase. It, it seems like, from a historical point of view, but you, you mentioned Alexander the Great, you mentioned Caesar. These were people that had a, a vision and a mission. They had a purpose, right? And, and in many ways, if, if they followed the teachings, in this case, from what you're saying, Aristotle, right? Then the the idea of arguing, right, and the idea of thinking classically was very attached to an outcome, a, a process, something that was trying to be attained. You know, in the case of Alexander, he obviously, you know, historically, we, we know everything that he did and why he's still remembered, you know, a couple thousand years after, right? But there, there, there was a, a, a vision, a mission, and a purpose. So it seems like is it safe to say that the argue arguing process back then was connected to doing something versus just being right? And is that where we are today, where people maybe argue just for the sake of arguing, whereas classically people were really trying to advance themselves or advance an idea or advance a society? Yeah, it's it's a loaded question, but it's a very good one, Raphael. Uh, if we look at, let's just take the two individuals we looked at, Aristotle and Caesar. Let's put aside their military exploits because many individuals, historians, uh, ethicists, uh, moralists would look at what they did and said that these were not morally moral people, that they actually had minds of conquest and that they went too far. If we put that aside and we just look at how they would have structured themselves. They had to be two convincing individuals to convince their armies to follow them. Remember, uh, Alexander the Great's father, Philip II, was assassinated, and he, as a young man in his 20s, had to take over this army and continue the war into Persia, which his father had begun and planned. And he had to convince all of these military individuals to follow him throughout uh, the Persian Empire, even as far as India. It must have taken a lot to be very convincing to do that. Caesar, the same thing. He had to convince his uh, fellow uh, military uh, countrymen to follow him against another military leader to actually engage in a civil war on his behalf and to swear almost loyalty to him over Rome. Whether you like it or not, whether it's a good moral thing or not, uh, these are convincing people. So what we want to try to actually bring to the audience is what did they learn classically? How did they learn to convince these people? And that's what classical argumentation is. Uh, in a nutshell, it's being able to take a position, to present it in a way to uh, 
refute any arguments that are coming back to you to convince an audience that you are right at this point and to uh, advance something and to walk away from that where you're learning. There's going to be a winner and a loser because someone's going to be convinced more so than someone else, but it's a different type of winning or losing. Remember, even the loser is walking away from that learning something because the loser maybe didn't know everything that was presented to them the losers, I'm sorry, didn't know everything that was presented to them by their adversaries. That is a very interesting point. So, you know, the I, I someone once told me a, a while back when I was when I was in high school, and I'm, I'm obviously paraphrasing, but that how, how does argumentation look like in in ancient Greece? Was you know you had two people, two or more people, you know, it could be you know, a number of people uh, engaging in a conversation or a discussion like the one you just described. And, and the idea is they will go basically, you know, one at a time and everybody is, every, every one of them is presenting their point and doing their thing, you know, and engaging and trying to be persuasive, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but eventually it has to end because at some point everyone uh, stops having points to present without repeating themselves, right? But what I was told is that Exactly what you said is that the idea was not to win in a way of imposing your view on the other, but to do so in walking away with something yourself. So you, you, you're you already walking into a an argumentative, a classically uh, designed argumentative exercise with the idea that I'm not just here to present. I'm also here to receive. Is that basically the essence of, of it when we think and argue classically? That's exactly right. You're going in, you have an idea. And uh, one of the foundations of classical argumentation is reason or rationality, though. What is the factual predicate for your position? You don't want to just state a position and walk away from it and ask the audience to have that accepted. We see that sometimes, unfortunately. We see it on devices such as Twitter. We sometimes see it on Facebook. We see it as uh, talking points sometimes with politicians. They just blurt out an opinion and they want you to accept it because uh, you must accept it because it's coming from a politician that they're asking you to follow and they're asking you to have automatic credibility just because of that. Or they're asking you to accept it because of the speaker on the TV. It's a certain news person on a certain channel. We have to start, I think, and I'm not directing or, or issuing a directive here or a rule here, but I think we as a society have to start challenging what we're hearing. What is the reason for what you're telling me? Let's break it down a little bit. Um, I do that as an attorney. If I have to cross-examine an expert's opinion against my client in the case, I have to look at what the opinion is. I have to look at the records that were issued to that expert that the expert considered in issuing the opinion. I have to see what factors into the case. And then maybe I have to start taking away certain facts to see would the opinion apply here with this fewer fact or here with the supplemental facts in there too. And I think we should start thinking about that with what we're hearing and what we're reading too. If you read something that seems inflammatory, it's, it's, it's actually speaking to your emotions. It wants to get an emotional response from you. It's not always bad, but don't always go with the emotion. I think break it down and say, uh, is that person speaking to a certain audience or is he, is he or she speaking to me at this point? And we learned some of this in law school. We learned when you break down an issue uh, or break down a topic, it's usually issue, law, application, and then you conclude. Classically, we see a little different. It's uh, presenting the issue or the claim, presenting your case on behalf of your position, having your opponent explain a position, uh, having an exchange of proofs of both positions, and then concluding at that point too. And, and what we talked about uh, earlier, you are going to walk away and you may not convince the audience of your position. Your opponent may convince them, but you're walking away knowing more so that when you have this topic again, this debate again, you've learned that. And if you have this topic, this debate, this argument with someone else, you're bringing in just not only your own experiences and your own knowledge, 
but that other persons who educated you on things that you may not have been thinking of too. But let me bring this the, to the everyday, um, to the everyday person, because it seems to me that um, what we've lost uh, along the way, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like uh, you know we we go back in time two thousand years, and people had arguments or, or uh, discussions or debates, uh, whether they were public or private. But they walked in, uh, and maybe not everybody did this, but at least the ones that were being taught how to do this, right? Um, the students of, of the Aristotles and the others, that they walked in into these types of situations with a balance of what, I, what they're going to say and what they're going to hear and listen to, right? So it's about, it's about that balance. It, it is, I'm not saying by that that it was 50-50, but it was, certainly wasn't 100 and zero, Right meaning I, I'm going to, only going to speak and not listen at all. There was some sort of exchange where it was already predetermined that I'm going to walk away here with something that I didn't have, whether I win or whether I lose. And if I fast forward to today, um, it seems like what happens is people are no longer motivated, interested, and the learning part, especially when the topics are very personal or, or where the topics have some, some element of belief, you know, in them is, is they're interested in just conveying, conveying, conveying and convincing. And it's almost like predicating preaching, which is no longer arguing. Um, how do we, I mean, do you have any, any insight on how did we get there and, and further insight on how, could we overcome that? Because I, at the core of this is, is what I believe is the problem, which is the, 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 the birth of this podcast is, is how, how do we communicate better? And to communicate better, one way is to go back a little bit to that model of listening a bit more, as opposed to just trying to be 100% persuasive. You're right. Listening is very important. And uh, so we make it clear to the audience, not everyone, even in classical time periods, if we talk about the classical time period from ancient Greece through the 6th century BC, even through the Roman times, through the Roman Empire in 5th century AD at that point, if we go even go through that time period, there are going to be people there clearly who are going to fight, who are going to exchange words they're not going to argue the classical way we're talking about. We're talking about the educated classical way, which we're hoping more people today could benefit from, because nowadays we have the ability to actually see information. If we, if we talk about through the printing press, remember, you had to have monks, uh, scribes, retype, uh, rewrite things. Uh, they didn't have typewriters there. They didn't have computers here where you had instantaneous access to information. I think part of the problem is the technology. We have too much information and not enough time to digest it. And I think what we're trying to do is to roll with the information and to make certain judgments, certain decisions on limited information without giving it time to digest. I have conversations with my associates, my partners, my clients about slow thinking. We don't do that skill anymore. We don't have the ability to actually have pen and paper out, have our um, literature that we're thinking about, that we received, and really thinking hard about what it means to us, how we could use it in my situation, how it helps or hurts my case, and how I could advance with it at this point. And I think the problem, Raphael, is... We don't do that anymore. Uh, we, it's easier for us to see a limited piece of information and to have it apply to our alligator brain and to actually strike back at someone because someone's taken advantage of us. We have to start giving other speakers the benefit of the doubt. And hopefully they'll do the same to us, that they're trying to persuade, but they're also there to learn from you. And that's what we're trying to convey to this audience is learn from each other uh, present a nice, solid argument on your behalf. Do the best you can based on the information you have there, but don't think that someone is out there to overwhelm you, to convince you, to pull you to their side. It's more so maybe you didn't think about this when you were doing that activity. Maybe you didn't think about this 
when you told that person to uh, do that certain thing. And that's what we want to do. We want to be able to actually have people slow think a little bit to say, what's the basis for you saying that? And uh, tell me how I'm wrong here. I What I try to do is in diffusing arguments, uh, real arguments that could develop even with you know family members, one of the things you want to ask them is, uh, tell them how, what am I missing here too? Uh, I want to see your point here. What am I missing? Give them the forum, digest that, and then go back to them uh, in a more professional manner. So that, that's wonderful. And I think that that goes in line very well with, with the previous episode on the, on the human mind. I think, I think one of the things that, that makes this very difficult for, for us in this day and age is the fact that especially if somebody is trying to convey something that is that is sensitive or, or inflammatory, uh, we lose the ability to see that what's being said is happening in the other person's mind, right? And that it has nothing to do with me. And that, and that, that thunderstorm of electrical activity that's happening in that set of neurons in that brain of that person that is trying to persuade me that that has nothing to do with me. That's all happening out there. But our primitive brain uh, makes us feel like we're under attack, you know, especially if a topic is something that's of, 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 of great importance to the self, which is another, another, another topic we're going to discuss at some point. And I think it's very difficult for the modern person. And it maybe it was for the, for the ancient person, but it's very difficult for the modern person to, to separate that reaction and that need to respond. And what you're saying is this precisely what, what I was trying to convey in the, in the last episode of observe your thoughts, observe your feelings, observe your emotions as a third party and observe the fact that this person, whatever the, the case that they may be, you know, presenting that the best interaction is going to happen if you stop process, think, put the feelings aside, and then come back with an educated argumentative point. Would you agree? Absolutely. And, and just to give the audience an example, what we're doing here, we're hoping most people would do. We're allowing each other to finish sentences. We're allowing each other to actually think out loud because many times it doesn't work ideally that there's just the constant information back and forth that's presented in this uh, almost automatonic situation where we don't have to interfere. I mean, AI is great, but that's not a real person. When, when you're dealing with a real person, there's there are things behind what that person is saying, and we never know what someone's going through. Someone could actually engage you in a heated debate. Uh, because they're going on through something. They're going through a divorce. They've lost a child. They've lost a parent. Um, they're sick. They have cancer. And um, they're trying to work that out, plus deal with the stressors in life. We don't know what everyone's going through. And, and to a certain extent, always think that someone is going through something always worse than you are at that point. Factor that in. If someone is going to present a position to you, don't think that they're personally attacking you until they do. You know, to what I do is I give people the benefit of the doubt until they personally attack me. And uh, I never do that. You know, one of the things we teach our associates uh, to do, hopefully they should be learning it in law school when they're learning about this argumentation process, is never personally attack. Never do an ad hominem. We call it attack because it takes away from your credibility. And credibility is something else we'll go into later in this series here. You always want to be credible. You want to be credible to your adversary to the judge who's going to read your papers, to your clients. Uh, and you're going to lose. You're not going to win every case. You're going to lose cases. But if you lose and you give them your best and you follow this model and you're professional and you're ethical and you're passionate and you rely on reason, you're going to lose. But again, you win also because you always you learn from losses. I mean, if we didn't lose, we wouldn't grow. I think part of losing is growing. And we have to remember that losing doesn't necessarily mean you're done, you're discarded, you're not wanted anymore. No. What it means, and actually uh, to attorneys' credits, when some attorneys lose big at trial, when they get hit big for verdicts against them, and they're on the defense side, 
they become more attractive in some ways to insurance carriers or other clients that may hire them because they were brave enough to take that case on. It may have been a dead loser to everyone else, but you took it on because you felt the client deserved that representation. John Adams, you know, who was going to represent those British soldiers who were accused of firing into Bostonians? Uh, John Adams said, you know, we, we, everyone deserves representation. Uh, for our credit, everyone deserves a forum. Everyone deserves the time to present a position and to have it heard. And uh, you there, are the, whether you're the audience or the opponent there, hear that position. And if you disagree with it, disagree with it in a way where you're not personally attacking someone, you're pushing back, you're refuting it, but you're learning in the process. You may be the opponent, but you're also the audience at the same time. So let me, let me, let me, I love that. Let me take that and, and, and present it a little bit differently and then see how, uh, what your thoughts are. You say, you know, everybody uh, deserves representation. You, you know, you know, John Adams, of course, that was, that was a great historical piece. That movie Amistad, you know, was a great, great movie representing a little bit of Wonderful. That. Yeah. Um, let me, let me uh, unpack that a little bit and say that before everybody needs representation, an idea needs representation, right? Uh, because I am not my ideas. I am just a, a being that experiences ideas, right? So I think that that will be a really good step. I, I don't know how this is taught in school these days. I, I don't believe that I was. I don't remember being taught how to debate or how to argue when I was in school. I mean, I'm, you're an attorney in the in my favorite city in the world, so you you get to you get to um to you get a lot of exposure to this type of dynamic, right? But if I go back and I said, okay, every idea needs representation. If 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 we as people can separate the fact that what I'm trying to convey is not me, is an idea that I happen to have. Or, or, a, or a position that I'm happening to uh, present or represent, right? Then it seems natural that back to, to the point of, of the topic of today is the, the background and the purpose of argumentation, that the best way to do that is not only is through a position that has both questions and statements, right? Uh, and it seems to me that today we're very heavy on the statements when we argue, but we're not very good at the noble questions that should come along with that. So is that balance? If I want to represent an idea and to present that idea, that I need to have a healthy balance of questions and statements around that idea that I'm trying to convey and then on top of that, realize that I'm not the idea, I'm not attacking, and I'm no, I'm, I'm also not under attack. I said a lot there, but what are your thoughts on that? That's a wonderful analogy. I think, you know, you sometimes you associate a person with an idea. You associate a person if they're of a certain political group, because politics could be very divisive these days. And you say, just because you're registered a certain way, you're going to feel a certain way. And... What we're hopefully going to actually have the audience think about is just because you're registered a Democrat doesn't have, mean you have to go vote down the line Democrat. Just because you're registered a Republican doesn't mean that you have to vote down the line Republican. You could actually have an idea, have a difference with that politician. We see some infighting here uh, every once in a while there. But we're asking, what we're asking uh, the people to do is to understand that sometimes the morality has to kick in. Sometimes the ethics have to kick in. I'll give, and I'll give you an example of an idea. You can have an idea that sounds on paper theoretically fantastic, but when it's played out practically, if you take it from the Plato mentality, the theoretical to the Aristotelian way, the empirical, the practical, you can actually refute an idea and see how it's refuted. And one of the best individuals to do that was Abraham Lincoln. Um, some of you may know that before he became president, he had a series of debates with uh, Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas at the time, in and around the early 1850s through 1854, was pushing something called popular sovereignty. Theoretically, it sounds great. You give the state 
and the people in this state the ability to vote on a certain issue, popular sovereignty, meaning it gets the popular vote. But you know what? If you break it down, as we're asking the audience to do, break it down, what's the issue that you're really asking me to accept as the audience? It's slavery. And what is Stephen A. Douglas pushing here is he's saying, forget about the Missouri Compromise that happened in 1820. Forget about uh, these compromises that we happened recently in 1850. I'm asking you now to forget about all that stuff, to find unconstitutional Missouri compromise because it's stopping the spread of slavery. And I'm asking you through popular sovereignty to continue the spread. And Lincoln, to its credit and to the country's credit, to our history's credit, stepped up and said, I can't allow that to happen. I can't allow the Constitution to be discarded for this principle, which only on paper seems like a great thing. But when you break it down, you realize that, no, what you're basically doing is allowing the spread of something that should have been ended many years before at this point. And I have to stand up to that and I have to debate you on it. And you had mentioned about questions. If if you take the time and I encourage everyone out there to read all of the debates, especially the first two or three, you see that they start out with questions. They actually present these hour long debates with issues and they respond to each issue and they're on a stage or on a platform. They are still in the 1850s they are arguing classically, you know, what we think of. They're on a platform speaking to an audience and addressing an issue. We don't have the time to do that these days. And in some ways, I'm sorry that we don't. But to actually go back in time, one of the things I love to do is to actually sit through one of those two or three hour debates and see how they argue their own points, but also take away the points of someone else, uh, not only with the morality, with some jokes, but also rationality. I mean, if you have two hours, you have plenty of time to break down someone's argument and present yours, especially when you see an issue which is debatable and refutable facially as well as substantive. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I love that um, historical reference. How do we, so to, to wrap this up, right? Because what I'm trying to do is, is it, it's, it's very easy uh, or it's fairly easily, easily uh, to, to see what's happening in, in, you know, in the political uh, platform. And, and, and as you know, I'm not, I'm not a fan of politics these days. <laughs> um, what I'm trying to do is, is, how do we bring this down to the everyday person on, on an everyday conversation, uh, whether that conversation is in the water cooler or that conversation is at home or at school about other topics, topics that are not necessarily, you know, political or religious in nature, but still nevertheless important topics in everyday life. Uh, how do we, what do you say, you know, to the person that's listening that says, you know, I get it. I need to communicate better. I need to uh, think classically, argue better at home uh, about schoolwork with my kids or uh, with my family about whatever the topic may be. How do we learn from these statesmen all the way back to, to Aristotle and to Lincoln to improve the quality of our communications day to day? Home is where it starts. I mean, it's a very good question. We, we, when we think about politics, we think of national politics, we think about taking positions on issues that may not personally concern us because we feel that we have to sometimes, or sometimes we feel we're morally obligated to do that. Even locally, you know, we see things here too. You know, we, we like or dislike certain politicians. We say certain politicians should be retiring because they're falling asleep uh, on the ch in the chair. We certain see, see certain other politicians saying they should be impeached. We have to be very careful about that. The whole impeachment thing, you have to be very careful. Sure, throughout history, some politicians uh, should have been um, impeached or, or impeachment proceedings should have been brought against them. But we can't use it as a knee-jerk reaction. We can't always go for the heaviest handle for things that we disagree with if there are less intrusive means of doing it and presenting it in a way too. People, people can be convinced to do wonderful things. And I, I think uh, all of us naturally 
uh, are naturally good. I think something, you know, I had mentioned before, the alligator brain synonymous with the reptilian brain. Sometimes individuals speak to that because they want to spur an action uh, without realizing the long-term consequences of it. You know, it all starts with the family, though, too. Before you get up, before you go to the political office, before you go to your office uh, to practice law, to practice medicine, to practice accounting, uh, to read a scene if you're an actor, to take out the garbage, to... um, work on someone's house, whatever you're doing, you're doing a solid job out there too, but it has to start in a solid way at the house. And I think the best way to practice, for lack of a better expression, this classical way of arguing is with your spouse, is with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your partner there. The best way to do it because you're constantly negotiating things. You're constantly figuring things out. You're constantly breaking up activities uh, for yourselves, for your children. How does that work? That's what you want to ask yourself, too. How can I, you know, if I disagree with my wife, my spouse, my partner, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, if you disagree with them, why are you disagreeing with them and figure out how you could work that out? Because that's what life is. It's negotiating differences and seeing the other side and trying to figure out maybe we could, you know, raise our child better by uh, doing that, or maybe we could actually uh, improve our own relationship by doing that too. No one's going to have all the answers. Um, Let's go back to Socrates. His biggest thing was, I don't know anything. Let me go around and figure out how much I know by not knowing things. Diogenes is another person. The story was he would go around looking for an honest man, looking for someone to uh, prove him wrong with things too. Maybe we should do that more often. Maybe we should figure out, you know, how can I be better as opposed to why aren't you following what I believe? Oh, that's wonderful. I like that. I think that as you were saying it, as you were speaking just now, it just occurred to me that what's what's missing is that we started talking about the lack of balance. Right. And and what came to mind is, is that it seems like we've lost in, in the in the field of arguing in the field of arguing, what we've lost is is the duality of, of, of who we are, because the, you know, there's gotta be, you know, give and take, there's gotta be ebb and flow. There's gotta be speaking and listening. There's gotta be, um, push and pull, you know, around the universe, you know, no matter where you look, you see this type of exchange that yin and the yang, you know, day and night. And it seems like when it comes to communication, what we've lost is, one side of that equation and all we want is is to impose a view without being open to the possibility that i could be learning something from this person that's sitting across from me um because of the ego or because i don't have respect for that person or because i don't see eye to eye you know with what they believe and that's probably where the source uh, is that's probably where we need to begin is is to acknowledge the fact that for every push there has to be a pull that's how the laws of physics work right uh if you take you have to give and never take more than what you give right and there's always you know a yin to every yang right and there is ebb and flow and if we bring that philosophy to how we communicate we may be taking the first step towards communicating better, towards arguing a little bit more like like some of the classical folks did, and hopefully engaging uh, with each other in a bit more educational and respectful way. Absolutely. That that's hopefully that if, if you take away anything, if the audience here because we're actually speaking to an audience ourselves. If they take away anything here, it's what you just said, Rafael, beautifully. Well, John, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm excited. This is the first one of many of these. I thank you for your time. I'm hoping that you're having a great, great day in New York City, my favorite city in the world. And uh, we'll be talking soon. Thanks again, Rafael. Look forward to it. Be well. Be well.